Greetings, I am Herbert Erpaderp, and today I'm going to build this King Tiger. As you might guess by looking at the box, this is a 48th scale plastic kit from Tamiya, and it was generously sent to me by Metro Hobbies who have sponsored this video. If you like what you see here, there's a link in the description through which you can purchase this kit for yourself. There's also a more general link you can use to look through all of the model kits and other cool stuff that Metro Hobbies have to offer. I've already done a what's in the box video about this kit, so we're not going to look at the sprues or other box content here, but if you'd like to see that, there's a link in the description you can use to check it out. Feel free to pause this video and go have a look. We'll wait. Just kidding, we're not gonna wait. Let's get into gluing the bits of plastic together. And the bits of metal. We start with this big metal hull tub. This will, obviously, give the vehicle quite a bit of heft. It also makes a satisfying clunk sound when you drop it. Though once you've got the plastic bits glued on, that is definitely not recommended. We start by adding these little end bits, final drive holding bits. Whatever you call them, they go into place nice and easy. Of course, because this is joining plastic to metal, I'm using super glue. Plastic cement, as the name implies, is for plastic and not very effective on metal. And by not very effective, I mean not at all effective. I then glue the rear plate into place, and this more or less just drops right into place. There's not much to it, really. Speaking of wheelie, it's now time for wheels. And I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but a King Tiger has quite a few wheels. We first turn a small pile of wheels into the outer set of road wheels, of which there are ten, and they go together really easy. Just make sure that you are not gluing them backwards or something like that. Otherwise, for the rest of your days, you'll be known as old backwards wheels. This pile of wheels and doodads will become the inner set of road wheels. These are pretty much the same as the previous wheels, though different enough that I think it's a good idea to do them separately to avoid getting parts mixed up. Obviously, these have a little hub that goes on them, which is easy to install. Then we can add these eight wheels to our pile. More wheels. This time of the toothy variety. These are easy to put together as you might imagine, but first we need to install the delicious polycap center. Then the two sprocket halves go together like so. There's keying here to make sure that everything is all lined up nice and neat, and that the sprocket will properly engage with the tracks. Idler wheels come next, and these consist of three parts, which are also keyed to ensure nicely lined up wheels, though this is more so the spokes line up than anything to do with the tracks. This is nice and easy and looks really good. Next, I get the super glue out again and use it to glue this final drive thingy to the front of the hull like so. There's a guide pin for this and the fit is good and easy. You may be thinking to yourself, Gee Herbert, when are you going to put those wheels on? Well, the answer is now. Again, I'm using super glue because we're joining plastic to metal. I glue the inner road wheels into place starting from the second rear axle. We then install a wheel on every second axle moving forward. There's a little bit of play in these parts, so you might have to nudge them and eyeball things until they look nice and straight. If they do bond into place at a weird angle, a super glue bond isn't all that strong, so you should be able to break that bond and reposition the wheel without too much issue. This here is a demonstration of one of the reasons the polycap in the drive sprocket is a good idea. It makes it so the sprocket can be installed and removed, which will allow the road wheels to go into place. If the sprocket was solidly there, the road wheel wouldn't go on, and vice versa. The outer road wheels go on just like the inner ones. The play is also there, so do be careful to line them up neatly. The idler wheel at the rear of the tank doesn't have any polycaps like the drive sprocket does, which is fine, it doesn't need them, but you do have to be careful when installing it because of how it interacts with the last road wheel. This isn't the most difficult thing in the world to deal with. Now that we've got all the running gear in place, why not add some tracks? I started with the curved links for the idler wheel. These are also for the drive sprocket, but I chose to start at the idler wheel. You might notice that I've glued four of these together. This is incorrect, there should be three at the rear. It's not really a big deal though. When I realised my mistake, I simply removed one. These tracks are obviously link and length, and they're pretty decent. Most link and length tracks from Tamiya are pretty decent anyway, though in fairness I have built better, and these are low level fiddly. 
The instructions don't give a starting point and there isn't any keying, so you do have to put a little bit of guesswork into the positioning of them. This did cause me a little bit of trouble when I got to the front, at least on the left side. However, if you follow the instructions and put the right parts in the right spots, things should go together pretty well and you shouldn't have too much trouble. In the end I got the tracks on and they do look quite good. There's some nice tread detail and it's not super noticeable where they don't quite fit at the front. On the left side anyway. The right hand side went together really well but I wasn't filming that. Anyway, because the King Tiger has side skirts, unless you choose to leave them off of course, you can kind of hide mistakes with the tracks at the top. So if you can't quite get them together perfectly and you're able to make a choice as to where the evidence of the tracks not quite lining up or completing the loop or whatever is, try to get it along the top of the tracks. I was not able to do that here, but I would have if I could have. Sometimes modelling is about hiding things and directing the eye away from things that might not be quite right. Let's work on the King Tiger's butt now, and that is of course the technical term. It's not a rear plate, it's a butt. First, I glue the jacking block here. This is nice and simple. Next, exhaust pipes. These have D-shaped keying to stop you from putting them on upside down, and I know that you would if you could. There is still quite a bit of play in the fit here despite the keying, so you'll have to nudge them and try to get them as straight and vertical as you can. I then install these, whatever they are, which go here, with the opening side of each facing away from the other. Again, nice and simple to get into place. The mounting brackets for the jack come next, and these are simple to install. The astute amongst you will notice that I'm holding the hull upside down to do this, and that's because this is the perspective that's shown in the instructions. I was doing this to try and avoid putting things on the wrong way, which is something I would never ever do, obviously, but just in case. Moving along, I assemble the jack. This is pretty simple. I glue on the mechanism, the bit the handle goes onto, and the keying makes it easy to get this right. At least it does if you put it on the right way. The handle comes next, and the instructions say to put it on this way, but it looks a bit weird to me. I feel like it should be folded around the other way, but I didn't want to rebel against the instructions. Then, this platey bit goes on. This needed a little bit of nudging, and you'll need to eyeball it to make sure it's on straight, but that's not too difficult. A little bit of extra glue to make sure the glue guard is happy and we've got ourselves a jack. Why not then install that in the little rack thingy we put on the rear plate? I mean, but. This pretty much just drops right into place. A little bit of glue to make sure that it stays there and it's installed. Very jack. The casings around the base of the exhaust pipes come next. There's a different part for either side here. The one for the right hand side has a couple of little brackety doodads on the bottom. You don't have to worry about getting these on the correct side though, because they both have different keying. So you shouldn't have any trouble with these unless you're really trying to put the parts on the wrong side. But you wouldn't do that, would you? The rear mudguards come next, and these go on nice and easy. I did notice the instructions pointed out for those wanting to apply their own zimmerit coating. The instructions point out areas like this to leave without the zimmerit so the parts can be installed. I think that's kind of thoughtful. As you can see here, we've got a nicely done King Tiger butt. It might not be obvious, but I've joined the upper and lower hull parts together, and the screws holding it together are quite visible. I forgot to record myself actually doing this, but I'm sure you can use your imagination to figure out what that might have looked like. Or you could have watched the live stream and you would have seen everything. The hull does go together pretty well, and I had no issues getting the screws to go in, though I have had problems with them in the past. It hasn't happened very often, but it has happened. The only problem I had here is that there's a bit of a gap at the front. A lot of the time these kits with metal hulls also have a plastic lower front plate, which does make it a bit easier to deal with any gaps there. That's clearly not the case here, so I put some super glue into the gap and applied some pressure. This did improve things a little bit, but it didn't completely close the gap, so I'll have to do some putty work later on. I did the same or similar at the rear, though this is obviously plastic, so we can use our good friend plastic cement here. I think there's meant to be a slight gap on each side behind those grills, but not so much in the centre. Once that's done, I add some shackles. 
These easily clip into place over the brackety bits, and you could glue them into place, but I've decided to tempt fate and hope they stay there with friction alone. They most likely will stay there, unless you're planning on handling the model really roughly, I guess. Fortunately, I'm not. What I am going to do though, is assemble a headlamp. This is nice and easy, and there's keying to help you get the front part on nice and straight. I must say this looks rather headlampy. I then glue the assembled headlamp into the mounting bracket, and this is quite easy as well, though you might need to do a bit of nudging to get it to sit straight, which is a little bit fiddly but definitely not the most challenging of things. The bow machine gun housing comes next. This involves gluing the inner bit inside of the outer bit. Well described Herbert, well described. Anyway, this is pretty simple. It would make sense to install the machine gun barrel next, so that's what I did. A bit of nudging so that it's pointing in at least a somewhat sensible direction, and that assembly is ready and can be set aside to bond. Next, I add these vent things to the engine cover, or at least I think they're vents. This is pretty simple, and it looks pretty good, but instead of installing it on the engine deck, I add the side skirts. I was actually kind of surprised by just how easy these went into place. They almost dropped right onto the model with no effort, though I did have to apply a tiny bit of pressure, particularly at the front, and a little bit of extra glue to get the parts to go together with a minimum of gappage. Good stuff. Let's celebrate this by adding another pair of shackles to the rear of the hull here. Again, you could glue them into place, but I've chosen not to do so. May the glue god forgive me. Hatches for the driver and hull gunner come next, and these pretty much just drop right into place. You could easily model these open if you wanted, but there's no interior, and this kit doesn't actually include any crew figures either, so you'd just have an empty void. And if that's what you want, go for it. I would imagine that if you did want crew figures, they shouldn't be too hard to find. Next, I install the hull machine gun. This is where you want to be sure that you're not going to want to unscrew the hull for any reason. It's easy to glue this into place, but I would imagine it to be quite difficult to remove without causing any damage. If you remember all those moments ago, I assembled a headlamp. Well now, it's time to install that headlamp, and this is very simple. Now, it's time for tools. The first of which is this shovel, which could be used for all manner of things, like digging holes or digging other holes. Then, this bar goes into place. The guides make this pretty simple to get into the right spot. Like the shovel, this could be used for digging holes, but you'd be better off using some other tool. What I'm assuming is the starting crank goes here towards the rear, and this is just as easy to install as the other parts. You'll notice that once the part's on, I add a bit of extra glue. Because this is extra thin glue, it will seep along the part and provide a good strong bond without making too much mess. The engine hatch goes on next, and we're already committed as far as being able to unscrew the hull goes, so there's no point worrying about it now. This cable and set of sticks, is this gun cleaning rods or something else? Who knows? Anyway, this thing goes onto the side here, nice and easy. Again, once I've got the parts on with a little bit of glue on the mounting points, I add a bit more along the edges for extra strength, and so that the glue god is pleased. A hammer goes on next, and this is probably not the ideal tool for digging holes, but you could do it if you were really determined. More cables and rods go on the tank's right, and they go on just as easily as the one on the left. This side of the tank does get a second cable, and this one is thinner and a bit longer. The part is easy to get into place, and it looks good. Next, I add this air vent cover thing to the front of the hull between the hatches. Not much to say about this, but as expected, it does fit well. Now to add some little discs to the engine deck. I guess they're vent covers or something, but they are also little discs. They do have different keying to stop you from putting them in the wrong places, but I guess you could put the one with the smaller pin in the bigger hole if you wanted. I don't know why you would, but you could. The third one here has keying so it goes on in a particular way. You can see this has a flat edge, so the engine bay door can be opened. Clever. The fire extinguisher goes into place next, and that's quite simple. It was at this point that I noticed the hull seemed to be a little bit bowed downward. I wasn't quite sure if this was my imagination, or if maybe I'd tightened the screw a bit too much, but it does look like it curves downward just a tiny bit. Or maybe it's just an illusion. It didn't seem to cause any issues anyway, so I moved on. 
The final hull detail is this pair of screen things. It'll definitely surprise you to learn that I'm not entirely sure what these are for, though maybe it's anti-grenade mesh or something like that. Not all King Tigers had this, so if you wanted to leave it off, I don't think that would be a real issue. This is the kind of thing that a lot of kits would have as a photo etch part, and that does look more convincing as mesh usually, but this looks pretty good as well, and once it's painted I think it'll look even better. Anyway, that's the hull done. And so, it's turret time. The first thing I did was to assemble the gun mount. This has some poly caps that go here. They took a bit of force to get into place, but they do go in. The instructions said to assemble the gun first, but I decided that this would be a better choice. I figured the longer this stuff had to bond, the stronger the gun mount would be, and then there would be less chance of stuff being forced out of place when putting it all together. Probably not really a huge concern, but sometimes it's good to think of these things. Once that's all together, it's glued onto the bottom of the turret, inside the convenient little guide thing. The gun mount should be able to elevate and depress, and that's what the polycaps are for. To create friction so that the gun doesn't just flop down. Nobody wants a floppy gun. Speaking of gun, it's time to put that together. This comes as two parts, which I'm not really a fan of. Though really it's not that bad, and it does go together pretty well. A little bit of nudging to get it to fit as best you can will go a long way here. Afterwards I scrape and sand it just a little bit to make it less obvious where the parts were joined. You could also do some putty work here, just to make it that little bit better. We're going to need something to hold the gun, and that'll be the gun mantlet. The back part of this goes into place nice and easy, though do be sure that you've got the parts around the right way. Then, the end, which looks kind of like a bit of plumbing pipe, goes into place here. This has keying so it can only be put on one way. Then, into the end of that, the gun goes into place. There's keying inside the mantlet that makes sure this only goes on one way, and ensures the muzzle brake won't be all wonky. You can see here how the gun will mount to the turret. This is why it's important to have the mounting bit on the turret the right way around. The gun mantlet isn't symmetrical, so it only goes on one way. The bottom of the turret can be glued into place next, and this pretty much just drops right into place with no issue. You can see in the bottom of the turret that there's some holders for crew figures, though none are included with the kit, but this means you could still easily put your own crew in there. I'm not going to do that because I don't have any crew to use and I don't want to, so I move on and glue the turret front on. This did need a bit of pressure to get it to fit nicely with a minimum of gaps, but that's not particularly difficult. Anybody can press on bits of plastic. You can see I've ended up with a nice turret body and a gun mount that can elevate and depress, which is fun when you're a sensible adult like I am. The turret might be mostly together, but there's a bunch of detail to add to it still, like this vent. I've heard that tank crews like to breathe fresh air, and ventilation should help with that. Then, on top of the commander's cupola, I glue this ring. Is it still a ring if it's not a complete circle? Whatever. This will hold a machine gun, but we'll get to that later. Next I glue the turret rear hatch together. This inner part goes into the outer part. Well said Herbert, very descriptive. You could easily model this open. I'm not, but the inside part is still useful, and should work as a guide for positioning this. I don't glue this into place yet, just in case I need to move it while adding these hinge cover things. They go into place on either side like so. Nice and easy. There's keying along the bottom of the turret into which they mount. I add glue around the edges of the hatch so that everything stays right where I want it, and I continue with the hatch theme by adding the loader's hatch. Obviously this could be modelled open as well, but I don't want to do that, so buttoned down it is. I do the same with the commander's hatch. This part pretty much just drops right into place, and it looks rather good. Next, I add this lift ring to the rear of the roof. You can see there are mounting points for two more of these at the front, and you could add them at this time, but the instructions didn't tell me to, so I didn't, and I moved on to the spare track links. These have guide pins on the back of them, which link into the little notches you can see on the sides of the turret, which make installing the spare track links quite easy. The kit doesn't include any empty mounting hooks for the spare track links, so unless you want to scratch build some, the only choice is to mount all of the spare track links. I was totally fine with this because I didn't feel like scratch building any hooks, and the spare track links do look pretty good. I follow this by adding the two other lift rings to the front of the turret. As you can see, you could do this with tweezers or your fingers. 
Despite being small fiddly parts, these are fairly easy to get into place, though they might need a bit of nudging to make sure they're nice and straight. Next, I add the mount for the machine gun. You can have this facing any direction you like, except where the mounting ring doesn't exist, I suppose, and I feel like you always see these facing forward. I want it to be a bit different, so I've got mine facing towards the right rear. I nudge it until it looks how I think it should look, and then I leave it to bond. The gun isn't very heavy, but I feel like it might still cause the part to slip out of place, so in the meantime, I install the main gun, and this goes into place exactly where you think it might. If you've done this right, the mantlet should extend out to the tank's right. There's not much to do now other than install that machine gun, which obviously goes onto the mount I just glued on. I think this looks really good. I don't know how often you would see a tank buttoned down with the machine gun up top, but I don't care. I think it looks cool. The turret can then be joined to the hull using the simple locking tab mechanism this kind of model usually has. I found it was pretty difficult to get the turret to rotate, which is a bit unusual, and I'm not entirely sure why that is. It could have something to do with the hull top looking a bit bowed, but it's hard to tell. If you wanted, you could easily trim down the tabs a little bit, and if this were a wargaming model where you would be taking the turret off to represent a destroyed vehicle, I might do that. But considering the only time I'm likely to remove the turret is during painting, I don't see this as a big problem, so I'll just leave it. Anyway, the King Tiger in 48th scale by Tamiya is now completed. I think this looks really good, and I'm sure you'll agree that it looks rather King Tigery, which is exactly what I wanted from this kit. I'm really happy with how it's turned out. I did have a couple of issues with it, mostly the tracks on the left side, though really that's more of a problem with how I put them together than with the actual kit. I also didn't really enjoy the two-part gun, I guess it's really a personal preference. And obviously these are really minor complaints, and the model is very good. I really enjoy these 48th scale kits from Tamiya, just in case you couldn't tell with how often I build them. I feel like they're just about the perfect size to get a lot of good detail on without taking up a whole lot of space on your shelf. They also tend to be really good quality and make for a nice, fun and relaxing build, and that does appeal to me quite a lot. I would say this is a pretty well detailed kit, I'm no King Tiger expert of course, but it really looks the part. There's bound to be some details that are omitted for various reasons, but that's just a fact of scale modelling. And if those things missing really upsets you, another fun part of the hobby is adding those details yourself. This kit could be a nice base for that kind of conversion work, if that's the sort of thing you're into. If not, it's still a nice display piece, and I think it'll paint up really well. Because if I don't mention it I get asked and hassled about painting, I don't currently have any plans to paint this. This is because I'm trying to work through my backlog of painting projects that I've already started. Gotta clear that queue out or nothing will get finished. As I mentioned at the beginning, this video is sponsored by Metro Hobbies, who were kind enough to send me this kit so that I could make this video, and I appreciate that quite a lot. If you like what you've seen in this video, there's a link in the description through which you could purchase this kit for yourself. Metro Hobbies stock a lot of great model kits, as well as a whole bunch of other cool stuff, so there's another link in the description you could use to peruse all of those things. Go and check it out. So a very big thank you to Metro Hobbies, and a hearty thumbs up. Okay, so this model was a lot of fun to build, and it didn't take an especially long time. Only a few short streams, which probably equates to about an afternoon's worth of gluing bits of plastic together for those without the distraction of streaming and making a video. Anyway, if you've got any questions or comments, feel free to put those in the comment section below. If you want to watch me build kits like this one live on stream, complete with the bits I forget to film for the videos, head on over to my Twitch channel where I stream regularly. You'll find the link in the description below. If you haven't already done so, why not subscribe, follow, ring the bell, become a patron if you want to see my videos a bit early, or maybe just come say hi on Discord or Twitch. And if you are feeling really helpful, why not share this video with your friends, or anybody you think might get something out of it. Links to all of my things are in the description below, and as always, I shall return soon. So until then, be excellent to each other, have a wonderful day, and thanks for watching. Farewell.